We all know that testing is incredibly important to write good, high quality software. And a lot of people, when they think of testing, they think of code coverage hand in hand with testing, and they assume that code coverage must also be amazing. And the more code coverage you have, ideally 100%, the better your code is. But this is just not true at all. Code coverage is honestly a pretty bad metric when it comes to code quality, and sometimes can even be a negative metric that actually makes the quality of your code worse by checking code coverage. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about why code coverage is not super ideal, what you can use instead of code coverage, and how to actually properly write tests to make sure that they actually test your application and are gonna make your code better. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And the idea behind this video came from the article titled Making Use of Code Coverage by Artem Zakharchenko. Hopefully I pronounced his name correctly. And essentially the entirety of this article is talking about why code coverage is not that great of a metric. And this is something that I've believed for a long time and reading through this article just reinforced a lot of my beliefs and really brought to light even some more things that make code coverage not that great. So in this video, I wanna talk about all of these different things. And instead of just going through this article, you can read this, I'll link it in the description for you. I wanna go through my own examples of this. So in this very simple code, you can see I have a test set up and this test is just testing to make sure that two numbers are being added together correctly. And if I go ahead and I run through these tests and I see what my code coverage is at the end, you can see I have 75% code coverage. My test is passing, so my sum function is working properly. 100% of my branches are being tested, yada, yada, yada. You can see all of this stuff is being currently tested. And the great thing about all these code coverage tools is I can even pull up this code coverage using a web browser to see exactly what's being tested. So I can see all the lines that are being tested, the lines that aren't being tested and so on. It gives me a ton of different information. But now let's say, okay, 75% code coverage is great. That's the minimum required code coverage for my company. A lot of companies have minimum code coverage requirement where you must test at least 80, 90, or maybe even 100% of the code. And if you don't have those code coverage levels, you're essentially going to fail your pull request and you can't actually submit your code. So in my case, I have to meet at least 75% of my code must be tested. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and you know what, there's a bug that's been introduced in the code. Someone posted and said that there's a bug with our sum function and it's not working as expected. So my job is to go ahead and fix that bug and hopefully write some good tests. So I'm gonna come over here to this script file and oh, you know what, here's the bug. We're multiplying A by two before we're actually doing the summing. So obviously it's not working properly. Now my test was passing because I had zero for A. So I'm just gonna write a brand new test that says it adds properly with non-zero numbers. And let's just come in here and we'll just do three and two, and that should give us five. Now, if we run this test, it should fail because we have not fixed our code yet. You can see we get our failure, that's great. Let's come in here and fix our code. And now let's rerun our test and we should hopefully at this point have a passing test. We do, all of our tests are passing. We added a new test to actually fix that edge case that we ran into. Obviously in real world code, this is gonna be much more complex, but essentially to fix the bug, we just removed some code that was either bad, not needed or whatever the case. But now you look, I only have 71% coverage. I no longer have 75% coverage. So now I can't actually submit this code. I fixed a critical bug. This could be a super security vulnerability bug, whatever it is. It could be something that needs to get merged, but I have less than 75% coverage. So it's going to automatically fail and I cannot merge this. But I didn't do anything but change the sum function. All I did was remove code and now I fell below that code coverage metric. This is obviously a very contrived example with very simple code, but this is something that happens all the time because honestly, some of the best things you can do to your code to make it better is to remove code. The less code you have, that means the less places for you to have problems, less code to read, less code to maintain, less code to change. Overall, less code is almost always going to be better than more code. So removing code is one of the best things you can do to improve code quality and the reliability of your code. But if you have an arbitrary test coverage number where you have to have at least 75%, 80% of your code, whatever it is, covered by test, now removing code is very difficult because if you're on that threshold, removing code may mean you drop below that threshold, which may mean you need to write additional tests for other pieces of code to make you hit that threshold. Or maybe you need to add code that doesn't do anything and is just there to fill up lines so that way you hit that threshold. It just adds extra steps and complexity to essentially removing code, which is one of the best things you can do in making your code better. Now, this may seem super far-fetched and weird, like it's never gonna happen, but honestly, this is something that happens all the time. It's happened to me when I'm programming and most other developers are gonna run into a problem where they remove code and the code coverage goes down and they run into an issue with automated tools because of that. But this isn't the only reason that code coverage is a bad metric. It's also a bad metric because it doesn't actually test what you want it to. 
you may think that if you have 100% code coverage, then that means your code is perfectly tested and there's no bugs because it's got 100% test coverage. But really all 100% test coverage means is that your code executed every single line. It doesn't mean every line executed properly. It doesn't mean that there's other things behind the scenes that didn't work properly. It just means every single line of my code was run at least one time in my test suite. Now this is great for saying, okay, overall, I probably have pretty good confidence my code works fine because every line ran fine and all my tests are passing, but it no way at all actually checks all the possible permutations or all the actual cases you can get because you may run a particular line of code with a particular test case, but that doesn't mean it's actually testing all the different things that could happen. A great example of this is when we had our code incorrect. You can see we were multiplying a by two here. We technically ran a test on every single line and our tests were passing at that particular case, but we still had a bug in our code because we weren't testing the actual intent behind all of our different functions properly. A really great way for me to actually showcase this is to write a test for this flag checker function. So I'm just gonna come in here. I'm just gonna copy this code essentially paste it down, we're gonna describe the flag checker function, and we're gonna say it works with true. There we go, make sure I spell this properly. And we're gonna come in here with our flag checker function. I'm gonna pass it in true, and that should just return to me the value of active. There we go. And now if I give that a quick save and I run my code coverage results, you can see here now we have 100% line coverage, statement coverage, function coverage. We've essentially tested 100% of the lines of our code, the nice thing about the code coverage checker I'm using is it actually checks branches of code. So like if statements and things like this that are actually doing ternaries, it'll say, okay, you tested this branch, but you never tested this particular branch. So I could come in here and I could write a test to make sure it works with false as well. So I can say it works with false, false, and then change this to inactive just like that. And now I will have 100% branch coverage as well. But if we go back to that scenario before where we had just this test for true and no test for false, I still have 100% line coverage. I've tested every single line of code in my code base, but that doesn't mean that my code is 100% tested because as we know, I never tested this particular branch. So this is another case where code metrics are not always correct. And this is even further emphasized if we have another function. We're just gonna create a function called is even. Is even, just like that, it's gonna take in a number and it's just gonna return number modulo two chest if that is equal to zero. So this is just one single line, there's no branches or anything. So if I come in here and I write a test for that, so we'll say is even, it works with even, and we'll say is even, and I'll pass it in two, and this should be true. There we go. So now if I just give a quick run to that, we'll see right here, immediately, I have everything being tested. If I just remove this flag checker code completely, there we go, get rid of this, we now we'll see that we have 100% of all branches, lines, everything is being tested 100%. But you'll notice something interesting. I never tested if this function works with a false number. I only ever checked it with an even number. Now, technically this does work properly if I pass in a false number as well as an even number, but I never tested for that. And a lot of times your code's going to be much more complex than a single line. It's going to be hundreds, thousands, millions of lines of code that you need to be testing. And just because you ran a test that executed every line does not mean that you actually tested the intent behind each line of code. And that's the whole idea behind the article that I showcased earlier. It talks all about how the most important thing about your test is that you're testing the intent behind what your code is supposed to do. A lot of times if you have user facing code like a web application, what you wanna do is you wanna to test to make sure the code works the way a user would expect your code to work. So a lot of times you're testing like clicking on buttons, dragging and dropping things, things like that, that a user is going to do. So it just because you have 100% code coverage doesn't mean you've tested for all the different ways a user can interact with your site. It's much more complicated to showcase that in example though, which is why I went with this simple is even example, because I've tested that this single line of code works and it works in my code coverage 100%, but I haven't tested the intent of this code because I never tested what happens in a false number scenario. So the thing you really need to think about when you're writing out your test is don't think so much about, okay, I wanna make sure I test this line of code and this line of code and this line of code. Think I wanna test test the actual purpose and intent of this function. What happens with this function when I pass in false? What happens when I pass in true? What are the different scenarios that this function can do? Different edge cases, things like that. Things that are going to happen in the real world. This actually leads perfectly into another scenario where code coverage is not ideal. And that's because code coverage really pushes you to write unit tests. Because unit tests are really good at going fine grained and testing individual lines of code because they're specifically for testing one function or maybe a couple functions. They're for testing very small segments of your code. So it's very easy to get 100% test coverage when you're doing unit tests for individual things. 
but unit tests are probably the least useful test that you can write. They're very easy to write and they don't take much time and they're very easy to like fix when they're broken, but they don't give you that much important information because a unit test does not work like an actual application works. It's testing a very small piece of your code in a very small vacuum on its own. But in reality, the way your program works is it runs all of the code and all of your code is interacting with each other. And you may even have like a user interacting with your code that adds another layer of complexity. So what you want to do to write good quality tests that test your actual application is to write more integration and end to end test. These are tests that test your entire application from top to bottom, the way that your user actually works with your application. And the nice thing about these types of tests is they're really geared towards how does your user interact with your site? Now write a test that does that. So they're much more high level and they give you much more important information. For example, I could very easily test a function that tests my Stripe checkout. Just a very simple, does calling the Stripe API give me the correct response? I could write a simple test for that. But if I wanted to really test to see if my checkout process works, I should create a test that goes from the very beginning to end of adding something to my cart, clicking on checkout, adding in all the payment information, clicking pay, making sure it redirects me to the thank you page, making sure it sends me an email. All these different things should be tested to make sure that actual process works. And that's much easier to do in an integration or end to end test as opposed to a unit test. And if me throwing around all these fancy word unit test, integration test, stuff like that is confusing to you, I have a full video covering the differences between all the different types of tests. I'll link it in the cards and description for you to really go over all that in depth if you're having a little bit of trouble. So now that I've talked about how code coverage is really not a very good metric for actually tracking how well tested your code is, what is the metric that you can use? Unfortunately, there's really no good metric. Code coverage is an easy metric because we can just look, did you test this line? Yes, no, binary, super simple and easy to understand. But really what you want to look for is have I tested the purpose and intention behind all the different pieces of code that I've written? When I talked about the Stripe checkout, a different checkout process, you wanna check, okay, can I add something to the cart? Can I remove something from the cart? But can I pay for something that's in my cart? What happens if I enter an incorrect credit card number? Essentially, what I like to do when I'm writing tests is think about how I use my site as a user and then go through all the different things that that user would wanna do from the most common down to the least common and also think about the most important things. Obviously, I want the payment process to work first. If, I don't really care if the remove from cart button or maybe the increment cart button doesn't work properly all the time. That's less important than making sure the actual checkout functionality works. So making sure that the most important and most used processes your users are gonna go through actually work first is the most important thing. So that's what I wanna think about. Okay, what are they gonna do? And what's the most important things that they do? And write my test for that. And even if I only have 25, 50% code coverage, as long as I've tested the most important and most used functions and things that my users can do, that's what's going to be much more important than writing a unit test for a sum function that's going to be used in like 1% of my code base. I don't really care if that works or not all the time. I really care more about the high level important things working from beginning to end. Now, learning how to write high quality good tests is definitely not easy, but if you want to get a start on how to write good tests and just to write good JavaScript code in general, I highly recommend checking out my JavaScript simplified course. It'll be linked down in the description below. It covers everything you need to know about JavaScript, including security best practices, testing, clean code, and so much more. So if that sounds interesting to you. I highly recommend you check it out in the link in the description. And with that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.